Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. Going to be having a conversation this morning with Mr. Jim Marchetto. He's a vice president at GoMart Scientific, and he's joining us here to talk about medical simulators. Welcome to the program, James. Right, thanks for having me, Neil. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Well, give us a little bit of your background to look into your area of expertise and talk about uh, your role there briefly at GoMart. Sure. Uh, my background is medical device. I've been in the medical device segment for my entire career after an uh, early career starting in medical research at Harvard Medical School. But uh, after that, it's been medical device the entire way. And uh, that's what brought me here to GOMARD because uh, GOMARD really is at the cutting edge of what's taking place in healthcare right now. And we hear so much about healthcare education. And that's what simulators really do is they allow nurses, physicians, first responders, and the military to really prepare for these medical emergencies. And the best analogy I could give would be a flight simulator. Mm -hmm. We know that pilots practice on flight simulators before they get into a plane to fly it. Medical simulators are a similar analogy. And a physician, a nurse, a first responder will practice on this animated patient mm -hmm. before they work on a live patient. So uh, GoMart is a family-owned company. We're in based in Miami, Florida. Uh, the company was founded by a physician uh, many years ago, or over 70 years old. And in fact, uh, his daughter is now the CEO of our company. So it's been in the family for quite a long time. And uh, we design, develop, and manufacture these very high fidelity simulators uh, right there in Miami. When you're talking about a high fidelity simulator, now, not being a medical yeah. professional myself, I see uh, a crash test dummy or the uh, the CPR <laughs> dummy from from years gone by. Tell us exactly <laughs> what we're talking about in these simulators. How lifelike are they? Yeah, it's extremely lifelike, Neil. Technology has changed so much over the years mm -hmm. that it's really allowed us to create these simulators, which uh, rather than, as you described, a crash test dummy or a CPR dummy, these are now very sophisticated robots, mm -hmm. and they're covered with a very lifelike skin. So to give you a specific example, we know that childbirth, uh, can be fraught with complications. And so we do have an adult birthing simulator that is the size and weight of an adult woman. And uh, this simulator, this robot, actually delivers a baby. And when she delivers that baby, that baby will mimic conditions that a neonatologist or a pediatrician will be looking for in a newborn infant such as if the baby is blue, if the baby is crying, uh, they can work on getting an APGAR score, mm -hmm. which is a way of measuring the baby's health at birth. So we make it that realistic because the point is engaging the learner in that process. Mm -hmm. It has to look realistic. It has to feel realistic. The baby has to be crying. There needs to be an umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. It needs to feel like a baby. So the learner can be very engaged and 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 care for this this robot baby just as if it were a live baby. And I can tell you, Neil, I've been through hundreds of training sessions with uh, this birthing simulator. She does have a name. Her name is Victoria. Mm -hmm. And when the baby is born, everyone who receives that baby smiles and holds it up once the baby starts crying. It has that visceral effect on us because it is so realistic and so engaging. And that creates this memory for the learner who can then repeat this over and over. So when the learner is in a real childbirth where there may be a complication, that student can remember, oh, I've been through this before mm -hmm. in training. And uh, that's exactly how realistic these simulators are. 
Are all of the products similar to Victoria? Do you have, uh, like, say, a, a realistic arm or a realistic uh, knee for knee replacements or a realistic head for brain surgery? Are all of them full body and fully operational for any type of skill? It's a great question, Neil. And actually, when we look at medical training and medical education, it really breaks down into several components. One is critical thinking skills. And that's what we were just describing with this childbirth scenario. Uh, The learner needs to practice this so they can think critically in a very high pressure situation. That's one segment. Another segment are basic clinical skills. So for example, uh, you asked about an arm. Certainly we do have trainers for an IV arm. And uh, a nurse, a physician, a paramedic, needs to know how to put in an IV. So they need to practice that routinely. Uh, Likewise, a Foley catheter, fairly routine procedure. Uh, So we do have basic skills trainers that allow these learners to master these basic skills that are critical in their career, but they have to start someplace. And in the old days, uh, doctors, nurses, and paramedics would practice on each other, you know, Mm. uh, inserting IV needles. And now there are what we call IV arms where they can practice on these arms. So we have the full spectrum of training simulators ranging from the very basic to the very sophisticated because that's what learners need. They need to learn a variety of skills from the complex uh, all the way down through the very basic. Can the facility staff easily maintain or repair these simulators? Is this something that has to have an entire crew of people just to prep it for training? Or is this something that the students themselves can uh, prep Victoria and then proceed with the training? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the maintenance and repair required. And uh, these simulators are designed for very basic maintenance. As an example, we talked about the IV arms. Well, these simulators do bleed and they do have synthetic blood that runs through them. So a common cleaning procedure would be to rinse that synthetic blood, which is basically just a a dye Mm -hmm. in water, but uh, to rinse that out so it doesn't harden in the vessels, in these synthetic blood vessels. So that's a basic cleaning procedure. Likewise, there's synthetic skin on these simulators to make them look and feel Mm. realistic. Well, that requires basic cleaning with a mild detergent, dishwasher detergent, for example. So that's the basic maintenance required. Now, in terms of setting up the simulators, prepping them, schools and hospitals do it in very different ways. Some... Uh, do allow students to maintain the simulators because it enhances their learning. They understand then how these simulators work and it allows them to enhance their operation of the simulator. Other facilities do have a staff in what is called the simulation center where there is a team that preps the simulators. So when the students come in, they can be immersed in the clinical experience and not have to worry about the maintenance of the simulators Mm -hmm. and getting them prepared. So we do see a spectrum of maintenance preparation, and it all depends on the facility's objectives and what they'd like their learners to achieve. Talk about how this pandemic has affected the effectiveness of simulators. I mean, students are remote learning. More people are doing hands off as opposed to hands on. What do you see as far as COVID-19 and training people to deal with that using simulators? One of the challenges right now for healthcare practitioners and educators is getting clinical time for their students. Uh, Typically, if you're a nursing student or a medical student, uh, the latter part of your education is spent in the clinic. COVID has prohibited that due to social distancing, due to um, people going into hospitals to gain this clinical education. What we've learned is that simulators have become a vital component to this continuum of learning. If a facility has 
Victoria, as we described earlier, or one of our other simulators, our adult males or our pediatric or neonatal simulators, a learner can go into that sim center I described earlier and practice on this baby or with Victoria and uh, practice their clinical skills, their critical thinking skills, their scenarios, for example, traumatic head injury on a five-year-old or anaphylaxis or um, a challenge with a neonate, a newborn baby. They can practice that remotely in a sim center being socially distanced so that when they do arrive at the clinic, they're prepared for it. And uh, also in regard to remote learning, we've actually included or created some new training modalities that uh, involve distance learning. So simulation has become so critical now, Neil, for learners to optimize their clinical skills before they ever get to a live patient. We'd like to learn more online. Where can we get some more information about GOMART? GOMART has a terrific website, and you can visit us at GOMART, spelled G-A-U-M-A-R-D.com. Well, I appreciate you taking the time this morning, Jim. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Same here. Thank you, Neil. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.